Now you see him. Now you don't. Welcome to the Disney Scrapbook, where together we take a journey to explore Disney history from 50 years ago. My name is Nolan. Today, I thought we'd take a look at Disney's second film in the Dexter Riley trilogy. Now you see him, now you don't. Released on July 12, 1972. The first film in the series, The Hilarious Computer War Tennis Shoes, was released on December 31st, 1969. And the third film in the series, The Strongest Man in the World, was released on February 6th, 1975. What I appreciate about these three films is that although they are a series that can be watched in sequence, they also maintain their independence, allowing the viewer to understand the plot lines even if the preceding film has not been watched, with the characters and location remaining the same. Each film encapsulates a complete storyline, somewhat like an episodic television series. The 88-minute film, Now You See Him, Now You Don't, is the fourth of six Disney movies to be set at the fictitious Medfield College. According to the Medfield Town historian, Richard DeSorge, in his book, This Old Town, Fleet 1-9, Walt Disney went to the town of Medfield, Massachusetts, several times to visit his friend, Justin W. Dot Sr. of the Walgreens chain, who owned Holiday Farm. Accordingly, it is believed that Disney first used the name Medfield in the 1961 film The Absent-Minded Professor after visiting the town. However, Now You See Him, Now You Don't was shot on the studio and back lot in Burbank. By a strange coincidence, Josh Morrow of Disney Parks Experiences in Consumer Products hails from the town of Medfield, Massachusetts. Joseph McVeady adapted the screenplay from an original story by Robert L. King. This was his fifth venture in the script writing. However, he had been active in the film industry since 1955 and was the son of director Bernard McVeady, brother of directors Bernard and Richard McVeady, father of film producer Stephen McVeady, and camera operator and actor Annie McReady. After sustaining a back injury while filming on location in 1968, he turned his hand to writing with his first script. Michael O'Hara, being sold to the Disney Studios, where it was produced as a two-part television program. Subsequently, he scripted The Wacky Zoo of Morgan City, the computer wore tennis shoes, and the barefoot executive, which I have previously reviewed on this channel. I will leave a link to that in the description below. Dexter Riley, played by Kurt Russell, is a science student at Medfield College, who inadvertently creates a liquid that can make objects and people invisible. Moreover, the enthusiastic students hope to use this invention to win a science competition, and thus $50,000, which would save Medfield from financial ruin. Unfortunately, the magic potion is stolen and put to use by a bank robber. A young Kurt Russell on the cusp of two successful careers, one as a professional baseball player and the other as an up-and-coming actor who had signed a 10-year contract with Disney in 1966. In his last film appeared on October 27, 1966, Walt Disney was promoting Follow Me Boys, and he closed by saying, You are about to meet a 15-year-old boy for whom I predict a great acting future. His name is Kurt Russell. And boy... Wasn't Walt correct? Kurt has gone on to win numerous awards and accolades. He was presented with the Disney Legend Award in 1998. 
With the blackness of a novice, Dean Higgins, played by Disney veteran Joe Flynn, is a bumbling golfer with an incredible stroke of luck. Here, he tries to show real-life pro Billy Casper how to hold the club. Although Joe Flynn has found his greatest success in comedy roles, he started acting in 1954 with serious characterizations. It was in the 1964 film, The Last Time I Saw Archie, where he played a comic that he began to be recognized as a comedian, especially when he was cast as Captain Binghamton on McHale's Navy. Here, and now you see him, now you don't, having previously appeared in Disney's 1969 film, The Love Bug, as well as the computer wore tennis shoes, barefoot executive, and million dollar duck, he portrays an inept small town college dean hilariously. It is his over the top performance that makes this film culminating in the final scene. This is the only film in which Flynn appears with gray hair. The tall, silver haired Cesar Romero plays the shrewd antagonist, A.J. Arno, a criminal who not only wants to turn Medfield College into a gambling establishment, but also plots to get his hands on Dexter Riley's spectacular science discovery. Romero began in films in 1944, under contract with MGM, Universal, and then Fox. Although originally cast as the Latin lover in films, he is probably best known today for playing the Joker in the Batman TV series. Actor and comedian Jim Baker co-starred as Timothy Forsythe, a golf-playing philanthropist who has $50,000 to award in the science contest. He was one of the few actors to do it all. Radio... Broadway, television, movies, and cartoons. Ultimately, becoming best known for the distinctive voice of the cartoon character, Mr. Magoo, and for playing first in How the Fern on the 1964 TV series, Gilligan's Island. He based his characters on people whom he had met or observed among his family circle of affluent friends in New York. In this film, his character is foiled to the character of Dean Higgins. William Wyndon plays a tolerant science professor Lufkin, an actor who accepted almost every job offered to him. Dexter Riley's ever-suffering loyal best friend, Richard Schuyler, is played by the child star making an adult comeback, Mike McGreevy. Although relatively unknown as a film personality, 24-year-old Mike co-stars as a disappearing college student in the comedy spoof of Invisibility, and who at this point is on the quest of a second acting career. He had recently graduated from UCLA in theater arts. Later, in 1972, he was to appear in Snowball Express, a Disney film which I will review on December 20th of this year. Save the date. Exuberant Joyce Menders plays the believable romantic catalyst in this film as Debbie Dawson. Menders had a short-lived career. After appearing in Disney's 1967 film, The Gnomobile, only to give it all up when she got married in 1972. Now You See Him, Now You Don't was directed by Robert Butler, who was convinced that all directing, whether TV, film, or stage, was the same, with techniques varying widely between the different mediums. But the basic problems of shooting a film musical, he believed, will be the same basic problems that are encountered during a TV or stage musical. Only the boundaries and tools are different. Butler was a prominent TV director 
who had success with directing the Disney films, the computer wore tennis shoes, and two films that I have previously reviewed, Scandalous John and The Barefoot Executive. His work in the medium of television could explain why, and now you see him, now you don't. There were quick cuts and a faster pace than traditional films of this era, making the film more dynamic and giving it the essence of more of a television film than a feature film. This was yet another film that the talented Frank Lee Phillips was the director of photography on. However, I feel that in this film, his talents at cinematography were underused. Unlike in the films, Wild Country and Scandalous John, which I have previously reviewed. However, his work did fit the requirement of the script. Now You See Him, Now You Don't was made before the advent of computer animation and consequently is full of special effects. Created by one of the most talented special effects men in the history of the Disney Studio, Academy Award winner Danny Lee. He was a mastermind of mechanical effects that can be observed in Disney's 1969 film, The and in the 1971 film, Phenoms and Broomsticks, that I have previously reviewed, and I will leave a link to that in the description below. The green Volkswagen Beetle, used by Skyler, was two Herbie cars from The Lupa. One was the vehicle carried by Mr. Wu's Chinese camp students, which was gutted and had a rubber truck tire tube under the passenger door, which, when inflated, would suddenly tip the car over. This was used in the scene when A.G. Arno rams into it. The other one used was when Skylar drives on a flat tire. The special photographic effects were created by Academy Award winner Eustace Lassett, who said that the idea is to develop believable optical effects. And this is done through composite photographing, which is placing in desired perspective on one film what is already on another film. His fascinating work is observed in scenes like the wake breaking the bunker, or the shoes walking without people in them, adding to the film's creativity. Disney's staff composer from 1963 to 1980, Robert F. Bruner, wrote the bouncy period music that helps give an uplifting atmosphere to the film. Ever since H.G. Wells' book, The Invisible Man, was first filmed in Hollywood in 1933, the secret of invisibility has filled audiences in countless films and TV series. And although, now you see him, now you don't, does nothing to reinvent the wheel, when it comes to The Invisible Man premise, it does offer some good laughs. I am really perplexed as to why the final scene with the students driving away in their cars was ever included and did not hit the cutting room floor. I thoroughly enjoyed this light-hearted film, and the climax for me is the penultimate scene, in which Dean Higgins discovers that he has become partially invisible. It leaves me belly laughing out of control. Thanks everybody for hanging with me for the analysis of this film. If you would like to watch Now You See Him, Now You Don't, it's available on iTunes, Amazon Prime, Google Play, and of course, DVD. If you enjoyed this type of 50th anniversary content, please like and subscribe and hit that notification bell. I will be producing more 50th anniversary content throughout the year that will include reviews of Disney films, LPs, books, and theme park content. Thanks everybody for watching. TTFN, ta-ta for now.